Hello and welcome to this first presentation about neutrons, neutrons here and there and everywhere. I try my best to hold this every Sunday at 10 p.m. Central Europe time on a Discord server called the Red Zone. If you are not joined already, I would highly recommend that to you. It's not my personal server, I'm just an active member there. If you are enthusiastic about nuclear chemistry or just nuclear stuff in general, I would highly recommend you joining there. And if you're already there, then I would highly recommend our nuclear seminar, which we try to realize every Sunday at 10 p.m. Central Europe time. Uh, we are all not professionals. I'm not a professional. I don't think any one of us is a professor at a university level about nuclear chemistry, but we are just all liking nuclear stuff and we talk it. It's quite casual. Okay, um, um, what are we going to talk about today? I will have to introduce you to some nuclear reaction basics, especially the neutron capture is one of many nuclear reactions. And then we have to talk about the neutron capture cross-section in order to then understand what is a nuclear or neutron poison, which ones are they, which ones are negligible, which aren't, and the short-term effect if you shut down a nuclear reactor. If you don't understand everything that I'm saying in this presentation, that's Okay, it's quite advanced stuff. We'll try my best to make the next seminar or the next presentation a bit more beginner friendly, but this is a presentation that I held before and I wanted for the first presentation to be something that I'm familiar with. But however, if you have questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments. Okay, um, coming from chemistry, we all know if you have a process, in this case methane burning in air producing carbon dioxide and water, you can write this down with a chemical equation. In this case, CH4 plus O2 produces H2O plus CO2. We all know that from basic chemistry, and for nuclear chemistry, we have a similar thing. For example, if we have bismuth 209, which gets irradiated with neutrons to form bismuth 210, you can write this down in a nuclear reaction, which looks something like this. You have your target, which is in this case, the bismuth 209. Then you have your projectile, which is the neutron. You have your ejectile, which is a high energy gamma photon. And then you have your residue, which is in this case, the bismuth 210. So, we are talking about neutron capture. This will always result in a high energy gamma photon being emitted. You can do some analysis with it. And what I'm trying to say is that a neutron capture is never just neutron coming in, but always a gamma photon coming out. It can be any capturing process. If you have an alpha capture or a proton capture, this will be an alpha gamma reaction or an N gamma reaction or a P gamma reaction. If we have a Reaction, we want to describe how well this reaction works. We know for chemicals, um, we have the K value and for nuclear reactions, in this case, we have a unit which is called barn. One barn, which is 10 to the power of minus 24 centimeter squared or 100 femtometer squared. And why is it called a barn? Is it like, like a barn door? Yes, it is like a barn door because when they are working on the Manhattan Project, they were irradiating stuff and they were thinking like, well, this, this kind of works a bit too well. Why? Why does it work too well? If we want to understand what's happening there, we have to go back and I think some of you may have heard about the size difference between the nucleus and the whole atom. So if you have one whole atom being one soccer field, which is 100 meters across, then the nucleus would be in the size of a cherry pit placed inside of the middle of the field. And what you're doing with neutron irradiation, you basically use an airsoft gun, um, blindfold yourself and shoot in the soccer field. <laughs> Let's see how well this will work out and how often you will hit this cherry pit inside. Turns out you don't have to actually hit this nucleus directly, but there is an area around it where you can hit it and it will still end up inside the nucleus. And this area that the neutron sees when it flies by this nucleus, this is called a barn. We have different barn, we have the geometrical barn, so how big this nucleus really is. Um, when talking about neutron capture, so this M gamma reactions, we always refer to thermal neutrons. So not fast neutrons that come out of nuclear fission, but thermal neutrons, so they are slowed down. 
Um, to give you some even more numbers, we have the hydrogen nucleus, which has a radius of 1.7 femtometer squared, and one barn is roughly the area that the geometrical barn for a uranium atom is. So now we can describe how well a neutron gets captured by a nucleus. Now we want to talk about nuclear reactors, so we have to talk a bit about fission. If you have fission, one neutron coming in, depending on the target that you are wanting to split, for example, if you want to split the uranium-235 atom, on average 2.47 new neutrons get emitted from this fission reactions by just one neutron coming in. So you have an excess of on average 1.47 neutrons per fission. If you don't control this, this will get out of hand and you basically make a bomb. And also the fission neutrons, so the neutrons that get ejected from fissions, they are fast neutrons and you are more likely to make a fission happen if you were working with thermal neutrons. So you have to slow them down. This slowing down to thermal neutrons happens by a moderator, for example, graphite or light water. And in a nuclear reactor, you are aiming for a multiplication factor of K equals one. So one neutron coming in and one neutron from this fission said neutrons will induce fission in another atom. In practice, you are trying to aim on a K value below one because you have delayed neutrons. So the fission products themselves can emit additional neutrons and you have to account for that. So, I, so we are trying to get a K value of below one and you have your control rods to intercept this axis of neutrons that will happen if you split the uranium-235 or plutonium-239 atom. So what is a nuclear or neutron poison? Well, a reactor operates with thermal neutrons and nuclei with high neutron capture cross sections, so they can capture neutrons quite well, they can be considered a neutron poison. Some of them are negligible, some of them are not. But for now, we are just talking about just general isotopes that are inside the nuclear reactor that have a very high neutron capture cross-section. What is a very high neutron capture cross-section? About one barn is quite good. Um, if we see, we have hydrogen, for example, in our moderator, the light water moderator, you have a neutron capture cross-section of 0.33 barn. And this is not quite high, but it's still something if you have, well, you have water everywhere, so it will add up. In addition to that, you have, for example, boron as boric acid, sometimes inside of the control rod and sometimes dissolved in just the water and if you look at the neutron capture cross-section it's 0.3 barn so this is not quite high but you also have another nuclear reaction that can happen which is an N alpha reaction and this happens with a cross-section of 3840 barn so this is quite high and this will also result in the neutron being absorbed you have an alpha particle emitted but the neutron is absorbed used up if you want to say that. We will come back to that later, but we should talk about the fuel, right? In fuel, you have some uranium-233, and if you look at the neutron capture cross-section, this is 47 barns, so this is quite high. You still have a much higher fission cross-section of 530 barn, but 47 barn is something that you shouldn't neglect. However, yeah, more interesting uranium isotopes, for example, the uranium-235. Um, it's most likely known for its fission, but it could also just capture a neutron, making uranium-236. And this happens with a neutron capture cross-section of 95 barns. And this is just 5%. No? Normal enriched uranium in light water reactors operates on an enrichment of about 5% of uranium-235. 95% of all uranium will still be the uranium-238, and this doesn't have as high of a neutron capture cross-section, but you just have way more of that. So this is something to keep in mind. Well, which neutron poisons are negligible? Water, because it's a moderator. It's always there. You can't get rid of it. And it's not that much. And it's also quite consistent. The boron impurities of your graphite control rods, it's there, but you can still pull the graphite control rods out of it. So you can make this neutron poison disappear. So this is negligible. And the neutron capture cross-section is not that high anyway. Um, you have hafnium as an impurity of your zirconium. The zirconium in the zirconium makes up the capsule which your nuclear fuel is in, and you still have some hafnium in it because they are chemically similar. If you look at all of these hafnium isotopes, you can see there are quite substantial neutron capture cross section of 23 barn, 
375. So this is something, since hafnium is only in impurity, inside of the zirconium, you can basically neglect it. However, what do you want to do? Get rid of it? Well, you tried your best when making capsules. Yep. Um, all of them are quite constant or in small quantities or both, and they all don't have such a high neutron capture cross-section. They are partly inside of the control rods and therefore they are extendable. Nothing to worry about. What are non-negligible neutron poisons is, for example, the xenon-135. The xenon-135 as a neutron capture nuclei is a very interesting example if you want to look at what happened at Chernobyl because you can oversimplify why Chernobyl happened by stating how well xenon-135 captures neutrons. So what happened there? It's, it's a gross oversimplification, but they were testing to throttle the performance. So they were trying to lower the performance. They inserted the control rods and then they wanted to end this test. So you basically shut down the reactor, not completely shut down the reactor, but you limited its power output and then you wanted to stop, they pulled out the control rods and they were wondering why is nothing happening? So why is the power not going up? Because it was after you stop the fission, you still have the xenon-135, which is a fission product, which can decay into iodine-135, which then decays into xenon-135. So if you pull out the control rods, you allow a much higher neutron flux to happen. But in the same time where you were throttling the power of the reactor, you gave time for xenon-135 to accumulate because you didn't have as much of a neutron flux, but you still have the decay of your fission product, which will produce your, your xenon-135. So the xenon-135 was building up inside of your fuel. And then when you pulled out the control rods, you expected a higher neutron flux and higher fission, but this higher neutron flux was already captured by xenon-135 with a neutron capture cross-section of 2.6 million bar. This is quite the highest neutron capture cross-section of any isotope that there is. So the xenon-135 was busy keeping the neutron flux artificially low and they were trying to get the reactor up and running and they pulled the control rods completely out of it. And all of a sudden, all of the xenon-135 was just hit by this immense neutron flux and then you didn't have any more xenon-135 because it was busy capturing the neutrons and therefore it will be used up eventually and will stay in the form of stable xenon-136 which is a um, magic nuclei and you didn't have anything to stop this whole neutron flux coming in. You didn't have your control rods because you pulled them out and all of the xenon was used up. So you had a very high neutron flux kaboom. It's a very gross oversimplification. Okay, um, there is another one, which is the Samarium 149. Um, this also has a very high neutron capture cross-section of 40,000 barns, so this is quite high, but it's not as much of an issue as Xenon-135. As you can see here, the isobaric yield or the chain yield in this example for the uranium-235 is that you get the 135 isobar, which makes up 6.5. 47% of all your fission products, if you all add them up, you will get to a number of greater than 200% because if you make one atom, you split it and then you have on average two new nuclei, so the fission products, and you basically end up with a fission yield of above 200%. And as you can see, the neodymium, so the 149 isobar yield, which eventually produces your neodymium, which then can capture neutrons, it's just 1% of all your fission products. So it's not as quickly. And if you look at the decay chain, for example, starting at tellurium-135, um, this is quite quickly adjusted. However, this takes quite a long time. If you have your promethium-149, this has to have some time in order to decay to this samarium neutron poison. Uh, you have this very interesting graph, it shows you the concentration of your neutron poison in relation to the time since initial startup. So you start your reactor, you start your fission, and then you have your buildup of your xenon because you build up fission products with that the xenon 135. And at a certain point, this will be in equilibrium. So the same amount of xenon 135 will be produced by fission and at the same time, the xenon-135 will be capturing neutrons, making xenon-136 
and then you have your equilibrium. However, if you stop your reactor, you don't have as high of a neutron flux, but you still have this iodine-135, which will still be inside of your fuel and will produce the xenon-135. So you have your xenon spike. And if you restart that, and of course, then it decays afterwards if you don't do anything. But if you restart it, you basically increase the neutron flux, therefore increasing the number of N gamma reactions happening with the xenon-135 and then you have your xenon dip and after this then it will get into the equilibrium again afterwards. And you have to consider this if you want to restart your reactor, if you don't channel. You can see the same here with the samarium. However, samarium doesn't decay as much because if you look at the half-life of xenon it's nine hours and the samarium is stable. So uh, you will never have decrease in neodymium if you never restart your reactor. So at some point all of your fission products will eventually decay into your samarium-149 then you have your maximum amount of samarium. However, if you restart it you have your basically your neutron flux which will then produce samarium-150 doing an N-gamma reaction and therefore decreasing the amount of samarium-149 that you have in your reactor, then it can build up from fission and so on and so on. This is some additional literature that I used for this presentation. With that being said, goodbye.